this now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the regular Thursday CPPC seminars. Uh, today we're joined by Jia Liu. Um, she is currently from the um, IPMU from University of Tokyo. She's an expert on cosmology and electrical structure and neutrino and dark energy fields. And she got her PhD from Columbia University and then held postdoctoral positions at Princeton and then UC Berkeley. And now she's in Tokyo talking to us about massive neutrinos and how we can try find it in the next generation surveys. Please take it away. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, good. Thank you Zui, for the uh, introduction. So I noticed that once I started sharing my screen, everyone turned off your camera. Uh, I actually encourage you. So this is what I do during COVID is for interaction. I try to pretend we're still in the same room. So feel free to turn on your camera. It's totally okay. You're eating or you are walking around. I don't mind. So, and having kids jumping around, I'm totally fine because my, my daughter jump into my Zoom meetings, even when I, was, when I give talks once in a while. She won't do it today, but it's totally fine. And uh, also um, feel free to raise your hand or just shout out questions throughout this talk. It's not super formal. Like I, I will stop here and there and uh, you can ask me anything. I also don't have to finish the entire talk. After the intro, I'll have some quick results. So we can stop anywhere if people want to have discussion, uh, it's totally okay. So mostly let's have some fun learning about cosmology and neutrinos. Okay, so I will talk about uh, cosmology with massive neutrinos. Uh, what do we know now? And how can we expect to constrain their mass or detect their mass in the next decade? So let me advance. Okay, so really quick intro. This is the standard model of particle physics. Um, from the outer layer to inside, you can see all these uh, fermions and uh, this uh, car force carrying bosons, the next four, and uh, in the center is the Higgs boson that gives mass to other particles. So I only want to focus on the outer layer. Um, if we look at the mass of the uh, fermions here, the other nine fermions besides neutrinos, if you put their mass on a scale, like this, so EV range. Even though some of them are leptons, some, some of them are quarks, mostly they lay in this region, MEV to TEV, they're fairly clustered in their mass. But if you look at the, the other three neutrinos, their masses are around EV range. So we don't know their exact mass right now, but from some measurement, we kind of have some idea they are probably lighter than EV. So if you put it here, put them here, you can see that despite all 12 of them are fermions, neutrino masses are much lighter, six orders of magnitude lighter than the rest of the fermion. So this particular uh, problem is very interesting. Why is there a gap in between them? So the mass generation mechanism behind neutrino is something very interesting, might potentially push us to new understanding in particle physics. So this is the goal or um, the motivation of my project. But right now we already know something about neutrino masses from neutrino oscillation experiments. Uh, we can measure the mass square differences um, from either solar or atmospheric neutrino or reactors. So we have two number of the mass square differences. Um, we know there's one big mass, one, two small masses. But then because we don't know the sign, so there are two ways of arranging them. You can have one big mass, two small masses, we call them normal hierarchy, or two large masses and one small mass, they are called inverted hierarchy. So the problem is we don't know what is the mass of this lightest neutrino. If we assume this number to be zero, we already can get some upper bound. So in the normal hierarchy uh, scenario, we have the number of 0.06 EV. This is uh, the smallest number we expect from the neutrino mass sum. If it is inverted hierarchy, we'll have an even larger number, 0.1 EV. So these two numbers will become interesting later in this talk. So take a mental note um, and then we'll compare this number to some other numbers. 
So what do we know right now? From part two experiment, we can measure neutrino masses from beta decay experiment, like the Katrin experiment in Germany. Um, so they have this year, they actually have uh, improved, improve, uh, improved constraints of 0.8 EV from their uh, experiment. From cosmology, current best limit, roughly, there are some code here and there giving you better limit, but this is somewhat a well-cited number, is from the Planck experiment. They, they combine uh, data from the primary CMB and the, from CMB lensing and the from BAO, I think from something else as well, maybe supernova. Um, but roughly you get 0.12 EV right now from cosmology. So if you compare this number, you can see that cosmology is giving almost an order of magnitude better constraint than part two experiment, which is really pe peculiar because you can, you normally think neutrino mass is a really typical particle physics number that uh, experiment on Earth should measure, but why is cosmology doing better? We'll talk about it later, but before we move on, I want to uh, give you an idea of what we can achieve in the next 10 years. So the Katrin experiment, uh, the tritium beta decay experiment in Germany is continuing taking data. So they probably take data for another year or two uh, per their original plan. So their expected sensitivity will reach 0.2 EV. And then future sensitivity from cosmology will do even better. A combination of experiments like LSSD, Simons Observatory, CMBS4, DESI, for example, or some permutation of them in the Europe, people use uh, Euclid. And you would also hear things like uh, uh, Roman Space Telescope. But the combination of CMB and the galaxy surveys, we're expecting about 0.03 EV. So again, comparing this number to future particle experiment number, again, we are an order of uh, magnitude better, seems like. And this 0.03 EV is particularly interesting. If you remember the number I asked you just now to memorize. So the minimum mass of neutrino sum is 0.06 EV. So if our sensitivity in the future from cosmology is 0.03 EV, it seems like we have very good chance to have a detection, or if uh, in the worst case, case scenario, we'll have very good hint of the neutrino mass. So to understand why cosmology is doing such a good job in constraining neutrino mass, let's have some quick review of uh, cosmology and cosmic neutrinos. So if you don't think about neutrinos or cosmology every day, um, here's a picture you're probably very familiar. So this is a brief history of our universe from left to right, uh, from the Big Bang to the right, you see galaxy formation and where they are today. So one thing you probably heard a lot is the cosmic microwave background, which happened about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So this, a uh, phenomenon happened when the photons decouple from the rest of the matter, from the matter, and then start free streaming towards us today. That is due to the expansion of the universe and then they decoupled. So this is, you heard about this a lot and then you saw data from Planck, for example, quite often. And what I want to point out is exactly the same thing happened previously, but for neutrinos. Cosmic neutrino background happened one second after the Big Bang. So it was much earlier. And it was neutrinos who decoupled from the rest of the matter back then and started free streaming towards us today. So physics is very similar, but you, you don't hear about cosmic neutrino background so much because we haven't observed uh, them yet. So it's, uh, you don't see a picture of them yet. So what, what does neutrinos do? Um, so usually we hear about the clustering of dark matter, the fact that we're seeing all the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies on the sky is because of cold dark matter, they cluster together. So for cold dark matter, because exactly because they are cold, when they see some potential well in the universe, for example, here, a cluster of galaxies, uh, cold dark matter just fall into the center due to gravitational um, attraction. 
and then they become part of this over density. However, for neutrinos, because they are hot, they free stream through this over density without slowing down much. So as a result, even though neutrinos are considered dark matter, but they are hot, um, they don't really cluster uh, in the same way as other cold dark matter do. So the result is they suppress the structure growth below their free streaming scale, which is about 100 megaparsec. So they don't really cluster much below that. If you look into the sky or in cosmological simulations, which uh, I'm showing here, on the left is a box of particles, about a few hundred megaparsec uh, at the side. This is a standard model of cosmology where people assume a lot of dark energy, some dark matter, zero neutrino mass. So you see that um, there's some clustering and then some large scale structure. On the right hand side is you boost uh, the neutrino mass from zero to a larger number. So in this case, you take part of the cold dark matter and turn them into hot uh, massive neutrinos. So they don't cluster that much anymore. But I mentioned that they only uh, erase structures below certain scale, which is about 100 megaparsec. So on large scale, you can still see that they're roughly similar compared to each other, but on small scale, they don't really cluster anymore in the massive neutrino scenario. So it is exactly this uh, erase of structure we're trying to measure in order to constrain neutrino mass. So how do we measure this clustering? By eye, you can see them, but uh, statistically, people like to use the power spectrum. So what power spectrums are, uh, Imagine you have rulers and you, you drop the rulers in the sky or in your simulation and ask the question, for certain ruler size, how likely do I find over clustering at the each end? And you do this multiple times, different direction, different angle, and then you measure um, the clustering as a function of, the, of your ruler size. And then you get the matter power spectrum that people use a lot in cosmology. So on the x-axis in the bottom is a wave number k, because I'm a theorist, we like to think in Fourier space. But if you like, think, like to think in real space, it's shown on top. So it's uh, in megaparsec over h. A vertical is the power. So the higher it is, the more likely you find over clustering at that certain scale. So to guide your uh, eye, I also show exact the, uh, well, the, the pictures or the structure you're, uh, you can think of related to each uh, scale. So on the right hand side is a small scale, on the left hand side is the galactic, oh no, it's the cosmic scale, the full sky. So the matter power spectrum is a really powerful tool in cosmology. So here you are seeing the red curve, which is theory. Um, and then you can see all these dots in different color. They are measured by different cosmological probes, including the CMB the galaxies, the blue in cluster, and the weak lensing in uh, purple, and lima alpha forest on a very scale, small scale in red. So they're really consistently, well, roughly consistently lie on top of this theory curve. Um, the matter power spectrum is really powerful because it is sensitive to dark matter, dark energy, and neutrinos. Okay, so remember that. But now, because I am interested in neutrinos, let's take a quick look how uh, the matter power spectrum can help us measure the neutrino mass. So again, this is matter power spectrum, theory only, but with different neutrino mass. So again, the scale uh, wave number on x-axis, power on y-axis. So different color shows different neutrino mass going from black to red, you have a larger neutrino mass. So we can see that on large scale, cosmic scale, they all lay on top of each other because neutrinos, they don't, they behave just like dark matter on a large scale. So it doesn't really matter much. But on smaller scale, you can see that they start differ. It is a bit hard to see um, because neutrino effect is very small. So we like to have a ratio plot usually. 
So what you can see is, oh, so this is just uh, the color curve divided by the black curve. So here you can see that as you go down to smaller, well, larger and larger neutrino mass, you see a larger and larger suppression in your matter power spectrum. It is exactly this suppression we are trying to measure in order to constrain neutrino mass. So how do we make this uh, model? So I want to talk a bit about uh, cosmology, how you do all this, um, build this theory to predict the matter power spectrum that I just showed you. So the structure formation in cosmology boils down to very few conservation laws. So the mass conservation, make sure the amount of matter you have is what you had before and minus what flow out of your region uh, at a later time. Momentum conservation and then Poisson's uh, equation, which links the gravitational potential to the amount of matter you have in some region. So those conservation laws are not unique to cosmology. You use it everywhere uh, in physics. But for cosmology, you need to consider one more thing is expansion of our universe, which is controlled by the Hubble law. So here, Hubble expansion, how fast you expand as a function of time depends on the density in our universe, the curvature and dark energy. And neutrino is part of this density. And if you fold this Hubble expan expansion into your conservation laws, then you rewrite your uh, structural formation equations like this. You don't need to derive, you just need to know there are three equations. So these equations are very good uh, to capture everything, but they are very hard to solve, especially when, you, when the numbers are large. So luckily uh, in our universe, most of the structure growth is fairly small. So what you can do is to linearize this equation. So assume uh, some of, uh, most of the numbers like velocity or gravitational potential to be very small. You can throw away all high order term and keep only the first order term. And you can have analytic solution usually. So let's take a look at, uh, again, a different scale in cosmology which regime we can really apply linear theory. So this technique of linearizing your equation is really good on linear scale. So in this uh, regime, your over density delta, which is defined by your density divided by uh, average density minus one, which is a fluctuation uh, on top of the average of your fluctuation. When it's much, much smaller than one, we can totally linearize our equation and get an solution. And uh, this is around uh, k equals to 10 minus one, order of few tens of a uh, few 10 times uh, megaparsec. And then you can still do the same thing, but doing some smaller trick to include higher order terms. So here your delta is no longer much smaller than one, but it's still pretty small. You can keep high order terms and you can push to mildly nonlinear regime using perturbation theory. However, on the very, very small scale, delta become much larger than one. This is scale a few megaparsec and smaller. So it's almost the cluster size scale and it's smaller. Everything is highly nonlinear you can no longer throw away higher order terms because they might be bigger than your first order term. And then the only way to understand this regime is through numerical simulations. However, if you remember the suppression plot, this is the suppression due to neutrinos. You can see that on the very small scale, neutrinos effects are the strongest. So in order to really understand neutrino effects, we really have to push to nonlinear regime. Okay, so now I, uh, I hope I convinced you that if we want to learn neutrinos, numerical simulation is something we can't avoid anymore. And back then when I decided to learn about neutrinos, I decided, okay, I have to run simulations. So let's move on to the next part, still theoretical modeling, but in the nonlinear regime. So I mentioned that it is very important to run 
numerical simulations uh, for neutrinos. And that is exactly what I did. I think when I visited uh, Sydney, maybe four years ago, I just started running the simulation and I showed you guys some of the initial results. And now four years later, I finished running simulation and did some analysis. So I'm back to report my results. Um, okay, so for those who weren't there four years ago when I visited in person, this is a large set of numerical simulations of um, massive neutrinos. So there are 100 of them. So before this set, there were some neutrino simulations, but then they only uh, model one or two cosmology and then you can't really do the full cosmology inference out of them. But I was interested in the final cosmological uh, parameter constraints. So I ran a really large grid of them. So in this uh, three dimensional parameter space, I modeled AS, which is the primordial clustering amplitude. So that is the CMB um, part spectrum, the, the height of it. You have omega m matter density and then the neutrino mass. I model two other parameters because they are the ones uh, we expect to be highly degenerate with neutrino mass. So we want to see the interplay between the different parameters. So each one of this dot uh, is one high resolution simulation with a varying neutrino mass. So you can see that the parameters are not really sampled regularly on the grid. We used a Latin hypercube, which is a technique where you sample somewhat randomly, not entirely, but smart randomness. So you can uh, well sample the parameter in 1D, 2D, and 3D, and also allow you uh, to interpolate among this parameter space to a, to a position where you did not model, but you can interpolate there uh, easily and uh, using Gaussian process, for example. So with this set of simulation, we generated uh, some, um, some catalogs and maps, including particle data, halo catalog, merger tree, weak lensing, and the CMB lensing. So they can be compared directly to uh, future ex ex expected observation from future surveys. So this is just a quick introduction to the simulation we use. Uh, now, after this, I want to show you the scientific result out of this simulation. So back to the very important matter power spectrum. Earlier, I showed you this plot and told you matter power spectrum is very important. It's sensitive to all kinds of parameters. And this is very true. However, I want to next convince you that matter power spectrum is not enough. We have to go beyond that for the next generation of observations. So matter power spectrum is only uh, complete for Gaussian random fields, but we live in a very nonlinear universe where things are not Gaussian at all. So here I'm showing you six maps, five of them are Gaussian random maps. One of them is non-Gaussian map from simulation, which is much closer to our real universe. Shout out which one you think is uh, non-Gaussian map. This is another Number trick four. question. Number four, I hear one. Very good. Anyone disagree? Number four. Number four, okay. So two out of two, which is 100% narrow <laughs> agrees. Um, it is number four, which is correct. Number four, it's not a trick question. It should be super simple to see by eye. So everything else, uh, all other five maps are Gaussian, okay, you also get it, great. Congratulations, you win the prize. Number four is the correct answer. <laughs> yes, it is non-Gaussian, it's from the simulation. Uh, using parameter um, matches what we think is our universe. Okay, so if you look at the power spectrum, all these six maps, this is what you see. One, two, three, four, five, six. So they look like this. Shockingly, they all look the same. Well, this is by construction, I, I, it's a trick I made because I actually use the power spectrum and measure from simulation to generate different Gaussian random realizations of the same power spectrum. Now you can see that there's something missing, right? If I don't make an arrow here point to you that map four is a non-Gaussian map, there's a no way you can tell from this plot that map four is any different from other maps. Well, by eye, you can see it's very different. 
So something is missing. Our beloved power spectrum is not measuring something we can identify by eye. We should be able to do better. So the simplest thing is to look at something else that captures non-Gaussian information. Here I'm showing you an example of PDF, which is a histogram of all the pixels in the maps I showed you. So map four is non-Gaussian and then really clearly it's different from other map. So, and then all other maps shows this very Gaussian symmetric bell shape. So I hope this one, uh, this quick practice already most motivates you to think about other possibilities we can do with future cosmology beyond the power spectrum. We can do PDF like I showed you here, but we can do something else as well. So what else can we do? Earlier, I mentioned this uh, ruler uh, analogy of measuring two-point statistic. To get non-Gaussian information, uh, if we just use very uh, dumb way of going to high order, we just count one, two, three, no, then we just go to uh, bispectrum, three-point correlation function. So instead of dropping rulers, we drop a three-dimensional, uh, well, three uh, sides, and then you drop down these triangles in the sky, and then triangles of different size and different shapes, and you ask exact the same question, how likely do you find overclustering at each angle of this triangle? So by spectrum is strictly zero if this is Gaussian map, and it will be uh, non-zero if you have some Gaussian information. So we did this with uh, the massive new simulation, and this is a work led by Will Colton uh, and myself. We measured the bi spectrum in weak lensing maps, uh, assuming a stage four like survey. And they want to ask, can we get more information on neutrino mass? So this is uh, only one projection just to simplify the result uh, in the parameter of matter, matter density, omega m, and the neutrino mass. So I'm here, here I'm showing you a comparison of the power spectrum, which is shown in uh, the black contour to the blue contour, which is by spectrum that we're interested in. So this is 95% uh, contour for LSSD. So we can see that um, by spectrum is doing comparable to the matter power spectrum, maybe slightly worse if you project down to neutrino mass, but it's already interesting to see that they're comparable because this is not using any new data, just applying a new statistic on the same data, costing nothing more than what you already cost uh, survey-wise. You can see that they can give very comparable results. But something more interesting is that you can see they are somewhat misaligned because bispectrum is sensitive to this parameter combination in a different way. So when so means it is having uh, is providing us some additional information. Then we found that if we combine these two together, we get this red contour. So you when you join power spectrum and the bispectrum together, we found about thirty percent tighter uh, constraint on neutrino mass. Nothing new, only adding one uh, one more measurement. And this analysis included noise, uh, realistic noise expected from LSSD. So this is a forecast. And we were really encouraged by this result because now 30% uh, more information coming for free. And then we want to ask, can we be more ambitious? Should we go to higher order? If we have bispectrum, can we go to, I don't know what, what is the four, quadrilateral, yeah, <laughs> that's what you call. So you can keep playing this game, go to higher and higher order. But in general, it is not a good idea. Back spectrum was already hard because you have so many things. You have to run a lot of simulations. It become more expensive to do theoretical prediction. And when you go to higher order, it just become out of control very fast. And then after all, um, even when you go to fourth order, you would still miss order uh, higher than that. So we want to ask the question, can we do smarter things that are simpler, but captures all order of information simultaneously? So this is one promising statistic we went after 
um, with uh, massive news as well. So this is a statistic called peak counts. So here uh, to explain to you what are peak counts, here is a convergence map, weak lensing map. Imagine a projected map or on the sky. And the black regions are over dense regions and the white regions are under dense region. Peak counts, it's very simple. You scan through all the pixels on your map and pick out the ones with higher value than the surrounding eight pixels. So this is very simple to do mathematic, well, uh, algorithm wise. And then you make a histogram of, uh, of all these peaks. But physically, uh, we have very good reason to use this statistic because in the past, we looked into the simulation, we found all these weak lensing peaks in the projected map on the sky, they are related to very high, highest dense region in our universe. Again, back to this cartoon picture, on large scale, neutrinos don't do much, but on very small scale, they erase fluctuations uh, smaller than 100 megaparsec. And it's exactly those very nonlinear regimes, neutrinos have the highest uh, uh, effect. So peaks are effectively looking at the places where neutrinos might have the largest effect. Okay, so we did look into uh, peaks in weak lensing maps and translated that to cosmology all the way. And this is what we found. So this is work led by Zach Lee, who was a student at Princeton, but now a postdoc at CEDA in Toronto. So what we found again is in the same parameter space, uh, omega m and the neutrino mass. Again, we put the power spectrum here as reference. And then we found peak counts give you this red contour, an uh, orange contour, which is already tighter than the power spectrum. So even though peak counts and the power spectrum, again, they are misaligned because peak counts, they're so tight. When you combine them, you get this black curve, which is not much uh, more improvement than the peak counts alone. So what we found is that using peak counts, this very simple statistic, we already get 40% tighter constraint than the power spectrum alone. So this is very exciting. And within LSSC, we're trying to push this forward uh, in our analysis in preparation for year one uh, analysis expected uh, around 2025 from LSSC. Now we are busy uh, in trying to understand uh, how to run simulations, how to model systematics in order to make, really make this uh, happen with data. Okay. So I want to pause if there's any question on all the lensing uh, high order statistic. Uh, there is a question from chat. Um, oh, I see. Uh, how do you, right. yeah. how you sample the initial power spectrum? Ah, so I, you mean how to uh, generate the initial condition for, so, so the power spectrum only come into play as the initial condition in our simulation, which we generate from CAM, which is just a very easy because it's from rest of hundreds. So everything was linear and that includes neutrino already. So that's how we did it. Okay, please let me know if it, it was not clear. Okay, so I would like to switch gear to some usually uh, ignored regions in our universe. So I talked a lot about the overdense regions. I circled them out. Those are the places we look usually because they're bright, they're beautiful. You can measure lights from them. But then I also want to point out that cosmic voids are very interesting objects in our universe as well. They're usually dark because by construction, there's not much stuff in them. But if you switch gear thinking from, from our usual mass centered uh, thinking to now volume centered thinking, cosmic voids actually account for the majority of the volume in our universe, about three quarters, depending on how you define the voids, but it's a lot of space um, in the space, a lot of space in the volume. <laughs> Anyways, so we're interested in cosmic voids because um, one reason, neutrinos affects uh, structures 
below 100 megaparsec. And cosmic voids, the ones we can find, are typically the size of few tenths of uh, megaparsec. The bigger ones are about 100 megaparsec. So they are comparable to the free streaming scale of neutrinos. And also, if you think about it, um, within voids, you are somewhat, um, you don't have a lot of matter in your voids. But because neutrinos are somewhat flat background, you have a little bit higher fraction of neutrino in your voids. So naively, we thought, OK, maybe neutrinos do something to the voids. And then we just looked into uh, my simulation and see if they do, they actually make any differences. So this is a work led by Christina Kreisch, who is a student, who is a student at the Princeton. So what she did is uh, she looked into the void. So here I want to define a little bit clear. For halos, you usually think of halo mass function, halo as a function of their mass. But then for void, mass is not really a good quantity, but rather the size of void is something more unique to individual void. So here for voids, we look at the void count as a function of void size. What we found is indeed, there's some uh, impact of neutrino on voids. So very similar to the power spectrum plot, but now we're looking at void uh, count plot. When you increase the neutrino mass from black to red, what we found is you have less large voids, but more smaller voids. So this is a bit like not really uh, uh, like uniformly for a power spectrum, you just suppress everything, but here is a bit of tilting. So the way to think of this, in order to get really, really large voids, you actually need to wait for matter to flow into those over dense regions and emerge the small voids and eventually you become one giant void. But when you have massive neutrinos because they delay, the growth of structure. So in those massive neutrino uh, cosmology, the material or the matter actually didn't have much time yet to flow into the overdense region. Therefore, you don't have much time to form the giant voids you would see otherwise. So that's just our intuition. Um, and that was very interesting to see that neutrino actually have an effect on voids. And then we looked into cosmology. So this is a simulation. Uh, we this is a work again using simulation, but not a massive news, but rather Quixote uh, simulation. So this is a work led by Adrian Bayer, and uh, we looked into combination of voice and matter clustering and the halo counts. How do we constrain parameters using the three um, three different probes? So this is a uh, constraint uh, on the neutrino mass and the sigma eight, which is matter fluctuation plane. So the usual matter clustering is this red contour. And then with voids, we have this green contour. And with halo mass function or halo counts, we have this blue contour. So if you look at individually, voids or halo uh, counts, they're not much better then, well, they are worse than matter clustering. But then we found this really different uh, degeneracy direction. And then when you combine them, you might get this tiny, tiny contour showing black. You have to zoom in to see it. So I have to say, I have to claim that this is a very simple Fisher analysis. And we're applying, trying to apply this to more complicated, uh, more. Um, uh, with uh, emulator like analysis, so you can see the actual shape. But this is already very intriguing, saying that if we look into other structures in our universe, we can potentially break this degeneracy and extract more information. So, this is really hard to achieve right now because uh, voice, uh, they are very hard to measure because in this simulation, we measured voice in particle data, but realistically, you see galaxies. So there's some galaxy bias folding in as well, we have to consider. And for halo mass function, it is also the same story. We have to figure out how to measure halo masses correctly. But then this work 
mostly tells us that if we try hard enough, there's a lot of information that we can potentially extract using different techniques. Okay, so I see there's one more chat, but I can't see. Ah, okay, that's just a note. Can I, can I just ask, uh, sure. uh, do you know, is there some intuition behind why this uh, voids the direction of the contours is completely orthogonal to the halo counts? Because I would have thought that it's kind of the same information because everything that's in the halo is is not in a void and everything that's in the void is just not the halo. So they're just the opposite of each other. So, so is there some something I'm missing here? So, um, so this is only one parameter space that's uh, very, very interesting to show. But then actually in other parameter space, they're not that misaligned. Only in this parameter, but it's really misaligned. So when you consider neutrino mass, it, and then it's better, sorry, let me move back one step further. Voids are actually not very useful for any other parameter. That's what we found. It's only for, for neutrinos, we found this really interesting uh, rotation of, um, of degeneracy. So I think what we came to, well, my intuition might not be correct, but my intuition is what defines the void and then what, what is the most important component to form halos or impact your matter power spectrum. So for matter power spectrum, it is a combination of the neutrino field and the, uh, the, the cold dark matter field. So that is why it's somewhat lying in between. But then for halo counts, I think there are past work showing that they don't really care about anything else. They only care about the cold dark matter field. So halo counts is almost has no impact on the neutrino field. But then for voids, we found, well, naively, they are really sensitive to neutrino field. So somewhat is, is the combination of the contribution of neutrino field and the matter, uh, cold dark matter field or a combination of them that gives you this rotation. Um, but exactly how that theoretically do, we probably have to investigate more. So, so in, in other words, if you can measure the clustering of neutrino field, you can measure neutrino mass really well, but then there's no way we can measure the neutrino mass field, but we can only do in um, indirect ways through other fields, which is void and matter clustering. Yeah. Very nice questions. Okay, so well, let's move on. So I talked about all this new method we're trying to develop to get neutrino mass um, like earlier if possible. Uh, let's take a look at the next decade. What do we expect? So I am part of this uh, Vera Rubin Observatory, which is a telescope in Chile, which is about to take data uh, in a few years. So give, a, give you an idea of the data volume we're facing. So we're all familiar with the SDSS survey, which is the major astronomical survey in, uh, in the past many years. So LSST will take data about, will get data about 15 terabyte per night, which is equal to 10 years of SDSS. And LSST will observe 10 billion galaxies compared to 10 million galaxies from SDSS. So just from this, this number, you can already see we're facing a big challenge of high resolution images and high high precision measurements, and we really need to uh, we really need to push forward our theory side of uh, work in order to really take advantage of all this data coming online. And I want to mention that LSST is not the only survey that will come online. In order to get the best constraint possible, we really need to combine different uh, different measurement from cosmology. So here I'm showing you two parameter space, neutrino mass that we talked about a lot and dark energy, W. So they are both very interesting parameters that all cosmology is trying to constrain, a cosmology survey is trying to constrain. But I want to point out if you only have CMB, this is a CMB S4, uh, you get this gray contour you almost have no hope to constrain neutrino mass on your own with CMB data alone. And with uh, CMB plus baryonic uh, uh, acoustic oscillation, 
you can constrain dark energy slightly better, well, much better, because now you have late time information. But then for neutrino mass is still not very hopeful. If you add, uh, if you look at LSST, which is a galaxy survey, only galaxies, uh, you get this pink contour, which is better than CMB, but not good enough. If you look at LSST weak lensing, which is this blue contour, it's really good uh, with respect to dark energy, but then still not very not good enough for neutrino mass. And if you combine LSST, uh, you have the green contour, which is really good for dark energy, but still not good enough for neutrino mass. Only if you combine CMB and the uh, LSSD or large scale structure measurement, you get this yellow contour that gives you very good confidence of uh, measuring neutrino mass in the future. So the reason is neutrino, uh, effect of neutrino is really time dependent. It suppresses at early time, it has almost no effect. And the late time you start to suppress the matter power spectrum. So if you only matter, measure the late time, matter clustering, you don't know what it was like before, and then you would get confused with other cosmology parameter. And if you only measure early time, you haven't seen neutrino effect yet. So it's a combination of um, measurement at different redshift give you the most powerful constraint. Luckily, we are seeing a lot of uh, cosmology surveys coming online in the next 10 years. So from Europe, we have Euclid and then we also have LSSC that I mentioned. Uh, in Japan, and then this is an international collaboration, we'll have uh, this uh, prime focus spectrograph. It is a, a spectral spectrographics uh, survey that will measure galaxy and spectrums. And then you also have SpearX, it's a space mission that will measure full sky uh, uh, galaxy distribution, as well as line intensity uh, mapping, I believe. And later on, you will see um, Roman Space Telescope led by NASA. From the CMB side, we're expecting observation from the Simons Observatory from Chile very soon. And then later on towards uh, the end of this uh, uh, decade, we'll see space mission from Lightbird and uh, space data from Lightbird and CMBS4. I have to say everything will probably shift. It's already shifting delayed by a year or two or three because of one COVID and two war in, uh, well, war happening in Europe. So Euclid is currently being delayed as well. But then the moral is we will see data from multiple surveys and the combining Galaxy and the CMB uh, will be possible. Okay, so this is mostly what I wanted to say already. I will have two more things for super experts if you care to listen, but I also want to pause if anyone wants to ask something. Actually, okay. I have a question uh, about this. Please. So um, before, at the very, very beginning, you said these space missions gonna get down to like um, point, uh, the cosmological, cosmological constraints gonna get down to like 0.03 EV. Yes. Does that guarantee um, us finding out whether it's gonna be inverted or normal hierarchy um, with the upcoming data? So very good question. So for cosmology, we can't tell the hierarchy. But then because I showed you the two number, 0.06 and then 0.1, if you get the number in between them, so you already know it's a normal hierarchy. But in cosmology alone, we are not sensitive to the, uh, the two hierarchy. So you will have to combine that with uh, the particle experiment measurement. Like. Oh, but the particle experiment, uh, I think- Oh, no, I mean, it, I mean uh, combine that you, because you know, uh, you know the true hierarchy from part two experiments. So, you know, once you are below 0 0.1, it, it has to be a normal hierarchy. But if you are above 0.1 UV, we really can't tell. Okay, I see, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I will have next two more very dirty points I want to show that people my star <laughs> doubt, well, this make me doubt my life often, but I want to still present to you why everything I talked about was uh, really idealistic, maybe still hard to achieve. So the current challenge, one is uh, so-called optical depth. 
So I lied a little bit earlier when I say CMB Photon travel towards us freely. It's it's tiny light because they did interact with other um, particles on their way. So there was this epoch of reionization when ele electrons got reionized by the first stars and galaxies, and then they were traveling around and then interacting with the CMB. So what they did is suppress the CMB power spectrum a little bit. And this is the parameter called optical depth that messes things up a little bit. And that effect looks like neutrino <laughs> effect. So, uh, but then problem of measuring this uh, op optical depth or tau from this epoch is really difficult. You need full sky, which means you have to go to space and you need to have really good polarization measurement. Um, so this is the evolution of uh, from early time uh, to now. So uh, boomerang and WMAP, Planck, Planck. So currently we're stuck with Planck tau for a long time because there's no space mission coming up until Lightbird, which probably happened in order of 10 years from now. So right now we're stuck with Planck. So if we have a uh, uh, light bird tau, you can see that, well, this is a neutrino mass and this is tau, you can see that they're super degenerate right now, even with CMBS4 and Euclid, you can potentially have a constraint, but it's um, really, really like, depends on your luck and then you need to try really hard. But if you have a better tau coming from light bird, you can see that you can shrink this down to a much smaller error contour. So usually I tell people with light bird, it doesn't really matter which experiment you combine, Elsa C or Euclid, and one of them, you will get a neutrino mass constraint. But that's 10 years later. Um, but before that, uh, that's why we're doing all this nonlinear nonlinear measurement and voids and the halo count uh, strategy and then see if we can push things more because everything here is depending on two point function but then there's a lot of information there we can extract even without tell so currently we're stuck with uh, playing with uh, smarter tricks to get information out before light bird flies okay this is one thing and then second challenge baryons so we're all made of baryons. There's no reason we hate baryons, but sometimes they really give us headache. So everything I talked about, uh, a lot of them are based on dark matter only simulations. So in dark matter, well, this is a simulation only showing stars, but then they kind of distribute like dark matter. So they are simple and easy, but then when you go to gas component of your simulation, for example, here's gas from the fire project, you can see that for the same galaxy, gas component is like puffier. So what, what baryons do, we call baryonic physics or feedback or astrophysics sometimes. It just means um, stellar formation and the galaxy formation, black hole feedback, they expel gas out of your dark matter's uh, halo. And the, that process is really hard to model. And we don't really have uh, we don't really agree on how to model those things. So the current situation is, if you plot the suppression due to uh, baryonic feedback, they look very similar to neutrinos actually. So that's one thing really worrying because they are all, they're both suppressing small scale structure. But then one thing more worrying is here, I'm showing you different hydrodynamic simulations modeling the effect of baryons. They disagree with each other by a lot. <laughs> So, so depends on which group runs the simulation, what subgrid model they use. You have different level of suppression. Also, you have different starting point of the suppression. So this disagreement is preventing us from moving to very small scales. So this is a scary plot to show that uh, from the dark energy official analysis from year three analysis, this is a current generation survey. So you don't need to understand what this plot about at all. All I want to show is there are really good measurements from shown as the black data points and they have arrow bars as well. So left is small scale and right hand side, they're the large scale. And then you can see their gray out areas. So in the official analysis, they've removed this region. So you can see that with all this inv investment in your survey, 
you get beautiful data on this small scale only to remove them later on because they don't know how to model variance on those small scale. So this is very uh, sad because there's a lot of efforts going to uh, observation and we get all this beautiful data, but our theory is lagging behind. So many people are aware of this problem and people are trying really hard to measure variance. And then, um, well, this is an plot. I don't want to explain, but it's just another plan plot showing that it's troublesome for future survey as well. But I want to just finalize saying uh, one thing about Barian is it's not entirely hopeless with the upcoming service I told you about that I said will measure neutrinal mass. They also will help us understand baryonic physics. They will help us understand as a function of redshift, how much gas each galaxy might expel to what uh, distance from the center of galaxy. So what we're expecting is as you see more and more data coming in from different surveys, will have better understanding of baryons and better understanding of cosmology and even improved understanding of baryons and uh, cosmology. So we are expecting this uh, spiral uh, evolution. That's my expectation and I hope that will actually happen. Okay, so that's my two uh, worries uh, for constraining cosmology and, and the neutrino mass. But to summarize, I still want to end on a positive tone, massive neutrino has very uh, high potential to lead to yet another uh, discovery in physics in the next decade. Almost guaranteed, I hope. But accurate modeling of nonlinear scale is the key for significant improvement from cosmology before we get a better tau. Finally, joint analysis of CMB and large scale structure is the only way to reach discovery. Okay, um, with that, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any question. Uh, thank you very much. That was very good, even though it ended a bit grim, <laughs> almost. <laughs> um, any questions from the audience? Uh, Kieran? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that, that very nice and clear talk. Um, one, um, I guess one thing I, I was missing with the, uh, when you're showing the comparison between the different hydrodynamic simulations um, for the yeah. The ratio of the, the two power spectra. So the um the y the scale of the y axis compared to the neutrino case. Like if I took for example the this illustrious curve, what mm -hmm. neutrino mass would that kind of respond to? Like is this comparable in size as well as the shape? This is much larger than neutrino. Okay. So neutrino <laughs> would be a percent level. So this is uh, well it depends on okay. the simulation I guess. So the hydrogen uh, baryonic effects are order of like ten percent. I would say, but neutrino is a, really a percent level effect. Okay. So this is it's a yeah. big deal. Yeah, <laughs> this is a very big deal, yeah. very scary. Um, yes. Um, the, the other thing I, I just wanted to this is a minor thing that I, I, I maybe I think I missed. Um, when you were showing the this this basically this plot, but for the neutrinos, what were the um the, like the little oscillations that you get in the kind of weekly nonlinear regime? Do you know where do they come from? Oh, baryonic uh, uh, BAO, I guess, which. I, oh, sorry, this is uh, very early on in my talk, I guess. So you're talking about here? Yeah, 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 yeah. So here, ah, so there are the BAO variant, yeah, okay, uh, acoustic just, oscillation, yeah, okay, yeah. BAO scales, yes. And then I think when you do a ratio plot, because it, there's some shift in BAO yeah, scales, okay, yeah, there's yeah. some mild change in yeah. uh, geometry, I think. That cost. Okay, so the the sort of the phase of these is like slightly changing with the neutrino mass. I think so. Okay. I yeah. So neutrino does shift this tiny bit as well. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a question uh, poking at the the baryons again. Yeah. So um, when you showed that um, the plot where you said they threw away half the data point. Yeah. Um, and it seemed like it fitted very well on the part that I threw away. So uh, what, what were they fitting? Like, how are they modeling it? So like, are they assuming something that's not realistic? So I think they, they, the model only fits to data to this part. And then, well, they still can fit things fairly well beyond, but then they threw this away because I think they tested on some, maybe some simulation and they found 
variants might potentially affect this region, then they, they decide to throw them away. But yeah, it seems like if they just extend the theory curve, it still fits pretty well. Oh, so I think if they include variants, the theory curve probably would be shifting somewhere else. But the, the dots of the data curve, right? So they... So the theory does not have variants in them. Okay. Yeah, but I think this is uh, one of their official results. But then after this, maybe recently there are paper, they are trying to fold in baryonic effect using some baryonic correction model uh, to push down to a smaller scale. But I think they're doing a really careful job as well. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. So, oh, sorry, yeah, I think there was a paper uh, later by DES collaboration, they did try to model nutri uh, non nutrient sorry, baryon effect. And I, I think they found around 20% level of improvement uh, when they go to a smaller scale. I think they push not all the way, but a little bit to a smaller scale. Yeah. All right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? And maybe one, this is not, not really about your talk, but um, I, I didn't know if you have, do you have an opinion of this uh, paper I saw recently about these uh, people, I think from, from Barcelona claiming that there was already evidence for the normal hierarchy from combining neutrino oscillation data and the cosmology. It was a slightly sort of, uh, it, I think it was to do with like the, the prior choice or something. Um, I, but I don't know, do, yeah. you, do you have an opinion on, on that sort of stuff? <laughs> I did not read that carefully, and uh, I feel every few years I see a claim of uh, normal hierarchy got squeezed out, there's no space, but then right soon after, people would claim that just because of the prior use and um, how you do your likelihood. So I don't have, I can't say anything wise about it, but yeah, I have to admit my ignorance as well on that front. But uh, maybe can I also ask you guys a question? So what are people working on uh, in Sydney nowadays about neutrino? Because I know Yvonne, Jan, you guys always, I mean, I learn a lot from you guys about neutrinos. And, but I'm curious what people are generally working on nowadays. I think Joel has to respond. <laughs> 